I'll be coming to Files Gap Field Station, which is located about a thousand kilometres west of Sydney in the Australian Outback, for the past 11 or 12 years. And given the amount of time that I've spent out here, I think it's quite a special place for me, I guess, and, you know, I almost feel like home here. Now, the research station itself was established by the University of New South Wales in the 1960s, really to understand how uh, sheep and uh, domestic animals impact the, the ecology of the arid zone, and also to understand really what the, the carrying capacity of domesticated animals is out here. But I'm a behavioural ecologist. And that means I'm interested in studying the behaviour of animals in the context of their evolutionary past and their current ecology. By ecology, I mean the environment that you see before you, the climate that one experiences here, and also the social environment, which is the environment that the individuals of the same species experience when they interact. I'm actually based at the University of Exeter in the UK, and although I've dabbled in studying mammals, my favourite animal of choice are birds. Now in 2004, I established a long-term study of chestnut crown babblers out here. And these are starling-sized cooperative breeding birds found only in the semi-arid and arid regions of southeastern Australia. And a range of factors drew me to study this species, and perhaps the most important one for me was that they'd never been studied before, and I really relished the idea of establishing my own study system particularly in an understudied desert type environment. I did my PhD on one of the rare cooperative breeding birds in the UK called the long-tailed tit and I've been really fascinated by cooperative breeding ever since. Being a cooperative breeder means that you receive help with rearing your, your offspring by other generally non-breeding individuals called helpers. Now this is very exciting from an evolutionary perspective because it's not immediately clear how genes for a behaviour are passed on to following generations when individuals refrain from breeding by themselves and instead help somebody else to do so. Now, a typical day of fieldwork really involves leaving the field station pre-dawn. And the advantage of being in the field this early is that babblers call very loudly to each other, actually, just at dawn. And so it allows us to be quite precise with our knowledge about where the groups are at a given moment in time. And we also take advantage of their tendency to fly between areas of cover in very close proximity to each other. We then can quite easily herd the birds into a line of mist nets that we've set up the previous day. Following capture, we take standardised measurements to assess the size and condition of each bird, and we fix a uniquely numbered metal ring and a unique combination of coloured rings around their legs for identification in the field. We also take a small blood sample to determine the gender of the birds and their levels of genetic relatedness. Finally, we insert a small microchip transponder under their skin, similar to that used in pets. 0000, zero, zero now the reason for using the microchip six is to really take advantage of the shape of the, the babbler nests. Now because these babbler nests are dome shaped, it means the birds must pass through an entrance hole in order to feed the chicks inside. And what we can therefore do is put a copper coil antenna around the entrance of the nest 
knowing the birds must pass through this antenna to feed the chicks. Now this means that we can then record the identity of every bird that goes through that nest antenna along with its date and its time of entry and we can therefore record with very precise detail which individuals belong to which groups as well as which group members contribute more or less to feeding those offspring. Now after analysing the data of nest visits over successive years, we're now just beginning to get a, a good picture of the complicated lives of this species. It now seems that the large social groups that we were talking about a bit earlier on, which can number 20 or 30 birds during the non-breeding season, break down into a number of smaller units for breeding. Now each breeding unit contains a single breeding female, but commonly multiple breeding males. And they also have a number of non-breeding individuals, which we call helpers. And these are individuals, generally previous year's offspring, which are staying at home and helping their mum or their dad to rear younger brothers and sisters. Now it seems like having these helpers is very, very important to successful breeding in this harsh desert environment. So for example, females breeding with many helpers are much more likely to produce successful offspring than those breeding with no or very few helpers. Now because these helpers, these non-breeding individuals, are almost always related to the offspring in which they're helping to rear, then they are passing on their genes to the future generations indirectly. So even though they're not actually producing these offspring themselves, because they're so related to them, they can still improve their evolutionary success. Now this is not unique to arid zone areas, but certainly it's been suggested that in very hard difficult climates and challenging ecological areas like we see at Fowler's Gap here, this type of behaviour might really help to maintain the survival of individuals in the population.